question here in the middle. You will have an opportunity to ask questions written or verbally following the speaker's uh, presentations. And at this time, I would like to ask, introduce a Port Hope resident and spokesperson for the uh, Port Hope residents for managing waste responsibly, uh, Louise Ferry Bletcher. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank you all for coming and joining us this evening. I've been asked on behalf of our group to give you a few introductory words about the group and about our guest speakers. Our group was formed in response to learning about a private for-profit company called Renewable Energy Management and their proposal to build a waste burning facility in the municipality of Port Hope on Wesleyville Road, south of the 401. The focus of our group is to prevent this facility from being built and to find other ways to responsibly manage our community's waste. REM has been communicating with our town staff and officials since approximately 2009. However, many of us did not learn about this until quite recently. We feel that information provided about this proposal has been unclear, left many questions unanswered, and provided contradictory information about the concerns we have raised. One such example relates to our questions about what exactly will be burned and how much garbage will be burned. This information keeps changing. REM reported, REM reported to our local media in 2009 that they proposed to burn up to 540,000 tons of garbage per year. REM then claimed in their application, which was filed in January of this year, that they plan to burn 200,000 tons of garbage a year. At the public open houses they held, they proposed 200,000 tons for the first line with, with uh, lines to other lines to follow. There is also communication between the Ministry of the Environment and REM, where REM, the Ministry of the Environment reports as follows. The Ministry of the Environment is working with REM through its Kingston office on the environmental screening process for the proposed Wesleyville facility with a planned capacity of 600,000 metric tons per year. This was dated last year. Or is it, as REM stated, in the advertisement they took out in the local newspaper, the Northumberland Today, on Monday, that 165,000 tons per year will be processed. I think you can understand our confusion. REM states on its website that those opposed to its company and this technology are well-meaning but misinformed and misguided. Well, our local group of farmers, business owners and employees, engineers, medical doctors, teachers, landscapers, basically people like you and me from all walks of life in this community decided that we need to better inform ourselves and inform the public about this industry of burning garbage, whether by incineration, gasifying, plasma burning, pyrolysis, whatever they're calling it. What does it all mean? So we can decide if this is what we want in our community. It is for this reason that we have invited a world expert to join us and to inform us about this. Dr. Paul Conant is a graduate of Cambridge University and holds a PhD in chemistry from Dartmouth College. From 1983 until his retirement in 2006, he taught chemistry at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York. He specialized in environmental chemistry and toxicology. Over the past 28 years, his research on waste management has taken him to over 49 states in the United States, seven provinces in Canada, and 57 countries where he has given over 2,500 pro bono public presentations on his opposition to incineration as a method of managing solid waste. He has based this on his chemical analysis of the byproducts of the process. In 2010, Dr. Conant gave, his two, gave two presentations on zero waste to the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development. Dr. Conant is often called upon as an expert witness in court cases and has also published extensively on this topic of incineration and on another area of his expertise, which is on fluoridation. In order to address those who believe that our group's only goal is to not have this facility built in our backyard, we counter this by saying we do not support this type of waste facility to be built in anybody's backyard. In researching the alternatives to burning garbage, we wanted to find out whether there are our alternatives that we can consider and find some that would be a better fit in our community. 
We know we all create garbage, and we need to manage it. But Port Hope creates approximately 5,000 tons of garbage a year. Northumberland County produces about 32,000 tons of garbage a year. We need solutions to determine if there are ways to reduce the waste we create, how to manage the waste, and how to manage this in our community. In order to discuss the alternatives to burning waste, we have invited Ms. Claudia Marsalis to join us this evening. She hasn't arrived yet, and we do hope she does. I'm not sure if she has some traffic problems on the way. But Ms. Marsalis is the Senior Manager for Waste and Environmental Management for the City of Markham. As the Manager of Environmental Policy and Program Development, Ms. Marsalis and her staff are working to divert 80% of Markham's waste from landfill by 2014. We hope she comes so she can share with us the challenges and the successes in her community. As we've gathered to hear our guest speakers, I will hand the floor to Dr. Conant to commence, and after that, we will have a question and answer period for you. The title, uh, A Gasifying Incinerator, A Threat to Sustainability. It's going to waste 25 years and it, it's also a threat to Port Hope's future. On the other hand, I've also learned that a threatened community is a strengthened community. If you hold together, work together, uh, you will beat this and you will be stronger for it in the end. So, the outline of my talk, first a few words about sustainability, And it's, this mouse is going to drive me crazy. I'm going to need a cat before the end of the evening. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to ask you to go to advance it for me. So, the arguments against incineration, the arguments against gasification, and an alternative waste solution which is a key stepping stone to sustainability. So I hope those who come in tonight preoccupied with the word no, no to incineration, will leave tonight with the word yes, yes to zero waste, yes to sustainability. Next. Next. A few words about sustainability. Next. Next. We would need four planets if everyone consumed as much as an average North American. Next. We would need two planets if everybody consumed like a European. Next, and meanwhile we have India and China uh, copying our consumption patterns. Clearly something has to happen, has to change. We've only got one planet. Next, and the best place to start that change uh, is with waste, because we all make it, and all the time we're making waste, we're part of a non-sustainable way of living on our planet. Next. So our task is to convert a linear society, which we've had since the Industrial Revolution, into a circular society. Next. So the linear society begins with extraction of raw materials, shipping them halfway around the world, manufacturing products, uh, consuming, next, consuming those products, and then of course throwing away, and that is our waste. This is a one-way system. Uh, it's, and it's the opposite of what nature does. Next. Now I'd like to look at the global impacts of this linear society. We use a lot of energy in extraction, in transport, in manufacture, and we produce in the process a lot of solid waste. In fact, 70 times more solid waste is produced in extraction and manufacture than we see uh, in the curb that we throw out. It produces air pollution, water pollution, and carbon dioxide. Next, and that carbon dioxide is contributing to global warming. Next. So now, the question I'm going to ask is how do the, do the different waste management practices affect this picture? So let's start with landfilling. Next. If we bury discarded materials, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning and start all over again. In other words, none of those impacts are mitigated if we landfill. Next. So landfills are not sustainable. I think that's pretty obvious. Next. Uh, if we incinerate, if we burn the discarded materials, again, there's no way around it. You've got to go right the way back to the beginning and start all over again, and, and none of these impacts are mitigated. So this whole notion that incineration or gasification is going to contribute to fighting global warming or 
go in a sustainable direction is pure poppycock. You can only maintain that, that incineration is, is going to make a con contribution to global warming if you restrict the argument to a narrow, very narrow co comparison between incineration and landfills. But if you compare with the real solutions, incineration is going backwards. Okay, next. So every time you bury, burn, or destroy something, you have to go back to the beginning of the linear society. Next. Um, and there it is again. If you burn, bury, or destroy, you've got to go back to the beginning. Now, so incineration and gasification then is simply not sustainable. So why are we spending so much money on it? Why, we, why do we have this big battle on our hands when it's going in exactly the opposite direction that we need to go? Next. Recycling materials avoids the impact of extraction. So we do intercept here. Next. If you see, if you recycle discarded materials, then you cut out the extraction of raw materials. You cut out those impacts. Very good. Okay, next. If we reuse and repair, that avoids the impacts of both extraction and manufacture. Next. There you are. See, so you cut out stage one, stage two, and you're going back straight to the consumer. Next. If you compost, composting avoids the manufacture of chemical fertilizer and the extraction of topsoils, things like peat. Next, so here's composting then, again cutting out uh, steps one and two. Next, but composting does more than that. Next, uh, it puts nutrients and structure back into the soil and treats the soil as an ecosystem, not, as, not something to stick plants in and squish them with fertilizer with synthetic fertilizers. It's an ecosystem, and we need to look after it as an ecosystem. It helps the soil hold on to water, next, and it holds on to carbon, next. Here is compost, and if you notice in that compost you can see bits of wood, bits of twigs and things, and you, bits that you can't see. If you burnt that in an incinerator, that, that wood would immediately be uh, converted into carbon dioxide, immediately. And in a landfill, it would be slowly converted to methane. But if you compost it, that wood will remain in the, the layers of the soil, depending on how deep it goes, for months, maybe even years. So that's another way to fight global warming. You're not using these high energy fertilizers on the one hand, and you're combating global warming by holding on to this carbon. Next. So more arguments against incineration. Next. <clears throat> Next. It's very expensive. Very, very expensive. And for that money, it creates very few jobs. I visited an incinerator in Brescia, Italy, which has cost almost a billion, billion dollars in subsidies and in our construction costs. But that only created 80 jobs. A billion dollars investment for 80 jobs. In this particular proposal, it's 150 million, and it's only going to produce 35 permanent jobs. This is a lot of money to spend on creating a very few jobs. Next, most of the money leaves the community. That's going to be the big difference between the solutions that I advocate. Most of the money is going to stay in the, in the community, creating local jobs and local businesses. In other words, that money works twice for you. One, you're saving, you're saving money from the tipping fees at landfills, etc., and also that you are uh, creating jobs and, and better infrastructure. Next. Um, incredibly, incineration is a waste of energy. Uh, you save three to four times more energy by recycling and reusing uh, uh, objects and materials than you do by burning them to create electricity. Next. And this table shows it pretty well. The, the first column in green is how much energy you save if you recycle that particular material. And the second column in yellow is how much energy you get if you use the energy to make electricity. And then in the third column is the ratio of how much more energy you save by recycling that material compared to burning it to produce electricity. And let me draw your attention to PET, P-E-T plastic. This is the plastic of, of water bottles, disposable water bottles. 26 times more energy is saved by recycling that material compared to burning it. 
So it's actually an environmental crime to burn these materials, particularly plastics. Next. Incineration is inflexible and stifles innovation. Next. This is a quote from Next. It's a quote from the, uh, what, once the former head of the European Waste Management uh, Department. And he told a BBC interview with the BBC, he says an incinerator needs to be fed for about 20 to 30 years, and in order to be economic, needs an enormous input from quite a region. So for 20 to 30 years, you stifle innovation, you stifle alternatives, just in order to feed that monster which you built. And if you don't believe that, let me tell you that right now, Germany, the Netherlands, and Sweden are all having to import waste from other countries to feed their incinerators. Next. Uh, incinerators produce a toxic ash, and it doesn't get rid of landfills as a consequence. Next. For every four tons of waste that you burn, you get one ton of ash or more. Incredibly, the, the company is saying they're only going to get 2% ash, for the bottom ash, 2%. They're going to get 25% at least, especially with their uh, technology, it's probably going to be more like 30% or more. And I'll explain why later. And nobody wants this ash. They're talking about using it in concrete, using it in asphalt and so on. They've been saying that. I've been listening to that, that statement now for nearly 30 years. And, and the company that was set up to recycle this ash to concrete blocks and so on, went bankrupt many, many years ago in Tennessee, Ash Recycling Corporation. So there's a lot of sales hype going on here, and uh, I think you deserve better than that. But we'll talk more about the details later. Next. And so about 90% of the ash is left under the, the grates, falls through the grates, just like your fireplace if you burn wood. And about 10% of the ash are these very tiny particles, which you hope the incinerator company will capture. And today, a modern incinerator, over half the money you spend on a modern incinerator goes into the air pollution control room. The cost of this is more than the rest of the uh, building and equipment put to, together. So I'm a little suspicious about their 150 million figure. I'm just wondering how sophisticated their air pollution control equipment is going to be. But let's go on. Next. Incinerators put many highly toxic, and I do mean highly toxic. This was the shock for me 28 years ago to find out that incinerators actually put out the most toxic substances that we've ever been able to make in a chemical laboratory. That was quite a shock. Next. Um, the, the toxins that come out, we get acid gases. Next, we get toxic metals. Uh, the toxic metals are elements, they cannot be destroyed. The best that you can hope for is they're going to end up in the ash, but then you have to treat that as a hazardous waste if you're successful. The worst, of course, is they go into the air and poisonous. And then in the process of burning, we also produce literally thousands, thousands of new compounds, including these dioxins and furans. Next. Yeah, just a few words about dioxins, because it's, it's quite a disturbing picture. Uh, dioxins accumulate in animal fat. Um, I did a paper with Tom Webster back in 1987. We calculated that one liter of cow's milk gives the same dose of dioxin as breathing the air next to the cows for eight months. Now, I don't know why anybody would want to breathe the air next to a cow or stand in a field for eight months, but if you did that, that's how long it would take you to, to get the same amount of dioxin that the cow's getting by eating the grass. Next. Now, in Germany, uh, the, the calculations there in one day, and this was based upon measurements, experimental measurements, in one day a grazing cow puts as much dioxin into a, its body as a human being would get in 14 years of breathing next to the cow. Now, the important point here is that when you see pictures of incinerators, they usually have these tall chimneys. And everybody looks at those tall chimneys and says, ah, oh, we'll get dilution, we'll get dispersion. But what they're forgetting is that Mother Nature reconcentrates those pollutants when they land in lakes and get into the fish, the aquatic system, or when they land in fields and get into cows or sheep or goats or chickens. They reconcentrate. 
And that's where we're going to get most of these pollutants. Not through our air, but in our food. Next. Oh, that's incidentally why you do not want to build an incinerator in prime farmland. Next. Dioxins steadily accumulate in human body fat. Now, the man cannot get rid of them. The liver cannot process, process these um, things like dioxins and furans. And so, uh, and the, usually the processing by the liver converts them to water-soluble substance and then, then you can excrete them through the kidney. But if you can't do that conversion from fat-soluble to water-soluble, then they just simply accumulate in our fat. Now for the man, it doesn't seem to make a huge difference. We accumulate them over a lifetime. But for a woman, she has a way of getting rid of these dioxins uh, by having a baby. So when she has a baby, the dioxins that she's accumulated in her body fat for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, whenever she has that baby, is going to be passed on to the fetus. In nine months, the dioxins move from her fat to the fetus. And all of a sudden, we've got this tiny, tiny, uh, almost a human being that's getting a, a concentration hundreds of times, thousands of times greater than we as adults are exposed to. This is the key issue. Next. And thus the highest dose of dioxin goes to the fetus and then to the breastfed baby. Next. Next. <clears throat> now the dioxins act like fat soluble hormones. Next. And they disrupt male and female sex hormones, thyroid hormones, insulin, gastrin, and glucocorticoids. So we're concerned about sexual development, mental development, and so on. And that's a brilliant paper by Linda Birnbaum, who's now the head of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Next. And a whole book has been written about this called Our Stolen Future by Thea Coburn and others. An excellent book, a very readable book. It's designed for uh, citizens to be able to master this disturbing subject. Next. Now, while modern incinerators have reduced dioxin emissions, there is no real accountability in Canada and the United States. Next. Which reminds me that uh, we need three things to protect the public from things like dioxins. We need strong regulations. Yes. Uh, we, we also need adequate monitoring. And we also need strong and tough enforcement from our government agencies. Now, if either two or three are weak, then one will not protect you. In fact, the, the evidence of that is that Russia, Soviet Union, had the strongest environmental regulations in the world, but also the most contaminated environment you could ever think of, because two and three were weak. Now, the monitoring of dioxins is particularly weak in North America. Next. Um, dioxins are only measured once a year, with the company getting advance warning, usually about a month. And then after a month, the, the laboratory comes in, they collect three six-hour tests under ideal conditions. In fact, if there's an upset during the testing, then they stop the test. So they get 18 hours of ideal data, which are then used to estimate 8,000 hours of real uh, operation. Uh, and this is a sick joke. That is an absolute sick joke that's being played on the public in North America. Next. Now, it's even worse than that, because we now know that these toxic metals and dioxins and furans come out on tiny, very tiny particles called nanoparticles. So if the accountability is poor for dioxins, it's even worse for nanoparticles. They are unmonitored and unregulated. Let me explain. Next. Uh, the, the particle size that is monitored right now in Canada and the United States are 10 microns. And they probably will go down eventually to the next 2.5 microns. But whether you're talking about 10 micron particles or 2.5 microns, these are huge compared to nanoparticles. And these are not regulated and they're not being monitored. We're just flying blind on this issue. And it's because of the interest in nanotechnology that people have started to ask the question, do nanoparticles have any biological effects? Do they have any extra problems? Next. Well, first of all, we already know that the 10 micron and 2.5 micron particles cause many health problems. And there are many studies now that have demonstrated that mortality and morbidity, death and sickness, goes up 
as particulate levels in cities go up. And the smaller the particles, the worse that relationship is, the more death and the more disease. And now, that's, the, that's what we know. And I think it's every reason to believe that nanoparticles will, will cause even more effects than we're seeing. Next. So, <clears throat> nanoparticles are not efficiently captured by pollution control devices. They're too small, they go through the holes in the fabric. Next. Uh, they travel long distances, so you don't have to live near the plant to get them. Next. They remain suspended for long periods of time. Uh, a day like today, you would wash many of them out with the, with the rain. And next. And they penetrate deep into the lungs. Next. And it gets worse. These particles are so small, they can pass through any biological membrane. So when they get to the lung membrane, they go straight through into the bloodstream. And same in the, the gastrointestinal tract. If you eat them, they're going to go into your blood. Next, once they're in the blood, next, uh, they are distributed throughout the body and they enter all the tissues of the body, and <coughs> including the blood, they can cross the blood brain barrier. Next, next. And here, in fact, is a particle in the brain, and it's from Italy. And this particle, they've, they've used the electron microscope in the, the um, scanning mode to determine what elements are in that particle. And the, the elements are, are lead, barium, chromium, iron, and silicon. And believe me, you really don't want those elements in your brain. Next. Uh, here's an extremely important article from Environmental Health Perspectives by Stephanie Cormier and others. And I have never seen a, a, a scientific response to that from industry about what they're going to do with this, do with this problem. Next. And a, this is something that you can read. I can send it to you if anyway. It's about 30 pages. It's a statement from Professor Vivian Howard, who I know very well, an infant and fetal pathologist, also president of the Royal Microscopy Society in England. And he presented these 30 pages on the problems of nanoparticles. Next. And I've seen no scientific response to Vivian Howard's statement either, from either the incinerator industry or government. So they don't regulate them, they don't monitor them, and they don't answer serious statements about them. Next. Next. The arguments against gasification. Next. Now, because of the extreme unpopularity of incinerators with the public, and don't forget, until relatively recently, they haven't built any incinerators in North America since 1995. Uh, from between 1995 and 2010, there were no incinerators built in, in North America. And now all of a sudden, we are seeing a flood of proposals in uh, Vancouver, in, uh, we've got the one being permitted in York, Durham, thanks to Roger Anderson, the, uh, the czar of that region, unelected czar of that region. Uh, we're getting one there. We've got an absolute atrocity in Ottawa called Plasco. And um, so all of a sudden, Canada that we looked up to in the United States is going backwards very fast. So because of the unpopularity of incinerators, they've come up with a whole new names for them, a family. So there's a family of closely related technologies. Uh, next. And these are called gasification, pyrolysis, and plasma arc facilities. Now, all claim not to be incinerators. We're not incinerators. We don't incinerate. Uh, however, all involve a two-stage process. Stage one, it, the solid waste is converted into a gas by different way, in different ways. And stage two, the gas is burned. And at that point, you've got an incinerator. So, next, the more accurate name for these facilities would be a gasifying incinerator, a pyrolyzing incinerator, or a plasma arc incinerator. So what we're talking about here then is a gasifying incinerator. That's what we're talking about. Next. Now I just want to throw some common sense. If this was a good economic development, every community would want one. I mean, every community wants jobs, every community wants economic development. Okay? So if this was really good, um, everybody would want one. Where's the competition? 
Where are the communities lining up in Ontario to grab this wonderful opportunity if you turn it down? I don't think you'll find that competition. Next. How many tons of waste does Port Hope make? Next. Uh, the company's figure, figures about how much waste is going to handle is all over the place, as Louise mentioned. It's all over the place. Why? If this is a serious proposal, they should know how many tons of waste they're going to burn. And they should be able to tell us where they've done it somewhere else. Okay, well let's go on. Um, Ontario Ministry of the Environment refers to handling capacity of 600,000 metric tons per year. August the 1st, 2011. Next. The company today, or yesterday, uh, refers to 165,000 tons per year. That's a big change, isn't it? Next. Now, 165 tons per year, they talk about 20% recycling. That would leave 130,000 tons per year for burning. Let's do some arithmetic. Next. Ash will be 25%, at least 25%. So you're going to get 32,500 tons of ash each year from this facility. Next. Now Port Hope produces 5,200 tons a year of trash. So in other words, with this facility, next, we'll produce at least six times more ash than Port Hope produces trash. Now, what that means, and about the same amount of ash as the whole county produces in trash. So what does this mean? This means that this proposal is not meant to solve your problem. What this proposal is, is dragging Port Hope into the waste business. That's what's happening here. Next. You are not solving your own waste problem, you are going into the waste business. Next. And you are going in as a very junior partner. Next. Uh, the company will get the major share of the profits, and I don't know what inducements they've thrown around, uh, when you will take the major share of the liabilities. You will be left holding the mess that they leave behind, whether it's an ash landfill or a defunct white elephant. Next. Uh, perception is critical as far as property values are concerned. And if you get labelled as a garbage town, as you will if you start importing willy-nilly waste from all over the place, uh, receiving stuff that everybody else wants to get rid of, uh, your perception is going to be a garbage town. And what will that do to your property values? Next. Um, is such a perception switch compatible with the proud claim in your, your town's newsletter, Municipal Link? This is what they say on page one. Port Hope is Canada's best destination. Well, how long will you be labeled Canada's best destination if you buy, build something or accept something like this? I don't think very long. Next. Municipal Link, April 2013. Next. Burning or gasifying mixed waste is a very complicated process. I know of no facility in the United States that is doing it successfully right now. If there are any uh, gasifying plants out there, then they're burning very selected waste of one kind or another. In fact, when the company refers to its operating plants in Indonesia or Singapore, if you look carefully, it's not mixed waste. It's specialized materials. So, um, you're putting your hands into a company that has an inadequate track record. Next. Has this company run a plant gasifying 100 tons of mixed waste a day let alone the 30, 300 tons, uh, in, which in one statement they've made, it would be 300 tons. In a, if you take the Ministry of the Environment statement, it would be up to 1,200 tons a day. So how close have they got to that? Well, let's look at their own next. This is what they say. On its website, the company claims that Entech brings more than 20 years of experience, and their systems have processed upwards of 7 million tons of waste 
through over 16 million combined operational hours. Well, divide the top number by the bottom number, go ahead, in your head, that's an average of 0.44 tons per hour, or less than 11 tons a day. So their own track record says, oh, after 20 years of experience, they've only managed to, to deal with, on average, 11 tons a day. But they're talking about doing it for 300 tons a day, or even as high as 1,200 tons a day. This company is clearly trying to run before it can crawl at your expense. So there's no way that they can claim that this is anything but an experiment in their hands. Next. Now I looked at the picture of their technology. Here it is. This is from their webpage. I look at this and I say, I've seen this before. I would hardly call this advanced gasification equipment. I've seen that before in the next picture. This is a dual chamber combustion unit. These facilities we chased all over the country to stop them burning. Consumat, they are building in, in Wyndham, Connecticut, Auburn, Maine, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, I could go on, uh, Hampton, South Carolina. These are rinky-dink operations. Uh, they're nowhere near anything you would call uh, advanced technology. This is an embarrassment to the incinerator industry to claim that this stuff is somehow a modern breakthrough and that they're doing great green things for you. Um, let me explain, uh, I'll give you the second picture, we might have to go back one. So this is, it's dual chamber. So in the bottom chamber they roast the, the garbage. They convert it from solid to a gas. And in the second chamber you see that short pipe, the gas goes up and they burn it in the second chamber. You can, you can find these things in hospitals all over the place, these dual chamber combustion units. Now could you go back to the first slide? Yeah, there we go. Now, the reason these were built, a lot of these in the 1970s and the 1980s, I think most of them were closed down in the 1990s, but the rationale for these was that they said, by not burning the waste here, not burning it here, but heating it up to drive off the gas, uh, was that you would minimize particulate emissions. And they thought in the 1970s and 1980s that this would mean that they would not need air pollution control devices to capture the particulate. And then the United States lowered the particulate standards and they found themselves having to um, put on the air pollution control anyway. Well, the end result was that these facilities like uh, the medical waste in South Carolina, the burnout here is very, is terrible. I picked out newspapers, pajamas, toothbrushes, plastic tubes out of these, these things. I, I, I can show the organizers here videotapes that I shot in Wyndham, Connecticut, Hampton, South Carolina. Those, jam, those things there, those rams are always getting jammed and someone has to go up underneath and unjam them. This, as I say, this is, I'm sorry, I, I don't wish to be rude, but this is, well I am being rude, it's Mickey Mouse equipment. But I would like to apologize to Mickey Mouse because he's brought a lot of... <laughs> anyway, next. This looks like a dual chamber incinerator to me. You look up Consumat. They used to build these things. Next. Um, many of these small facilities were built in the 70s and 80s, usually to burn hospital waste. Next. Um, this uh, Mickey Mouse stuff. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, the peel, by the way. Peel. Uh, near on Toronto has this technology. They've got five of these things in a, in a series. And when I went to that facility, I couldn't even see across the tipping floor. floor. It's dust everywhere. Uh, I mean, I pity the poor workers who have to, to work in that, in that area. In fact, I did, I did the trip at the invitation of the Crown, some Crown uh, company, somebody that was looking after the environment, and I went with Richard Gilbert, a, a former councillor of um, Toronto, and he was very pro-incineration. He came out of this facility, he looked sick. He said, this is nothing like the incinerators I've seen in Europe. This was terrible. And that was a real proponent of, 
of incineration. Let me say it again. This technology is an embarrassment to the people that really try to build excellent incinerators in Germany, Sweden, and other places. Next. Next. Uh, I'm aware of, I'm not aware of any commercial operation gasifying mixed waste in North America. Um, is this project a genuine proposal or is it an investment scam? In other words, if it's an investment scam, if you're setting up a company where once they get a memorandum of understanding, they can then broadcast to everybody in the world that they're going to build this fantastic thing, it's going to do f many, many fantastic things, then people will start to invest money in it. Uh, and goodness knows what happens after that. But um, that's the only thing. To me, there's so many things wrong with the numbers that to me it, it, it smacks of people not caring about the numbers because they know it's never going to be a reality. That basically you're setting up a dummy to get the money, to get the money. Well, I, I may be wrong on that, and I apologize if I am, am wrong, but I, I, I just don't understand how something that could have gone this far and ruined the lives of many people in this community could have gone forward with such a pitiful um, inadequacy in terms of information, a real concrete information that you need. Next. What inducements have been offered to your decision makers? Now, I don't say that lightly. I know, for example, that in Bristol, Connecticut, the company Ogden Martin then, now is called Covanta, paid $3 million to one individual, Philip Armetta. Philip Armetta, this documented, it's in the newspaper, the company did not deny it. They paid him $3 million to expedite the decision by Bristol, Connecticut to host an incinerator. So for these incinerator companies, there's a lot of money to spread around. Uh, that's on the record. We know that. It's, it's worth, in the case of these big incinerators, billions of dollars to them. They've got a gravy train for 25 years once they've got the contract signed. Next. How many jobs do they say they will create? Only 35 permanent jobs for a 150 million investment. Next. Uh, we can get more than 10 times that number of jobs for far less investment with safer, cleaner, and sustainable alternatives. Next. Um, the following slides are taken from Green Action. Next. Uh, they document the dismal track record of, of various gasification, pyrolysis, and plasma arc torch facilities. And I want to show you now the difference between PR hype, which is what you're experiencing here, this is PR hype, and reality. Okay, next. Next. Industrial claims, pollution free, zero emissions, proven to be safe, zero waste, a new way to recycle, waste is renewable energy, not incineration, alternative to landfills. There's all statements made by these companies. Go, next. Uh, this company, Thermo Select, was built in Karlsruhe, Germany in 1998. Next. It was closed down in 2004 due to operational problems and the facility has now been demolished. But they talked a really great story about this plant. Next, this plant was built in Wollongong, Australia. I visited the plant. I asked them for their dioxide emissions. They promised to give them to me, never gave them to me. A few months later, it was uh, halted. Next, uh, it was closed in 2004 because of financial and technical problems and the facility no longer exists. Next, integrated environmental technologies and in NTech. Next, uh, pollution free, not true. Commercially proven with no emissions, not true. Uh, closed loop system, not true. Uh, five facilities are already successfully operating at customer sites, not true. So all these statements were being made false. Next, gasification. Key questions to the company. Where are your plants up and running? Where are they? What are you burning there in these plants? Next. What size are they? Tons per day. Next. Where is the emissions data to support your claims? Where's the data? Next. Has that emission data been subjected to independent review? This is an absolute basic menu for what you need to know. You're not getting this information. Next. Um, this is what an engineering consultant said about this technology. Next. 
Many of the perceived benefits of gasification and pyrolysis over combustion technology prove to be unfounded. These perceptions have arisen mainly from inconsistent comparisons in the absence of quality information. Absence of quality information. Next. That's the firm of consultants in Cheshire. Next. This is a letter from Lurgi, uh, Italian company that is explaining why it stopped uh, building uh, gasification. A decision has been made within Lurgi to discontinue marketing gasification and pyrolysis technologies for uh, waste conversion applications. Next. This decision has come after rigorous analysis of market requirements, technical feasibility, and economic sensitivities of gasification and pyrolysis of waste, as well as applied by Logi and our competitors. Next. Uh, we recognize that there is a positive bias towards gasification amongst politicians and environmentalists. However, we are in no doubt that in the short to medium term, neither technology will be developed and commercially proven to the point where it can compete. Lurgi, I think there's the date there, two, no, 2004. Letter dated 2003. Okay. Next. Anyway, now let me switch gears. Even if we made these incinerators work, even if we made them safe, even if we found a place to make uh, to, to place the ash safely, we would never make them sensible. Not in the 21st century. Next. The modern incinerator is attempting to uh, perfect a bad idea. Next. Our task in the 21st century is not to find better ways to destroy discarded materials. Our task is to stop making packaging and products that have to be destroyed. That's a central message of zero waste. Next. The waste problem will not be solved with better technology. There are no magic machines to solve waste. Or rather, these are the magic machines. These ten things here. Next. Uh, but with better organization, better education, and better industrial design. Next. So that brings us to part four of the last part of this presentation, the alternative strategy to, for waste, which is the zero waste strategy. Next. Zero waste is a new direction. Next. We need to move from the back end of waste management to the front end of resource management for a finite planet, for a single planet, better industrial design and post-consumerism. Stop assuming that we're going to be happier and happier the more things which we buy from the shopping mall and find a different way of becoming happy and our children, for our children's sake. Next. We need three things to get to zero waste. We need industrial responsibility at the front end, upstream. We need community responsibility at the back end, downstream, and we need good political leadership to bring these two together. Next. Next. So I'm going to talk about 10 steps to zero waste. These, basically, these 10 steps are simple, they're common sense in action, uh, they are politically acceptable, they're cost effective, and all the equipment that we need can be built and run in our own communities. We don't have to run off and employ German engineers. Next. So there's the 10 steps laid out for you. I'm going to come back to them in a moment. Source separation, door-to-door -door collection. You're, you're familiar with many of these. A composting, recycling, reuse, repair, waste reduction initiatives, economic incentives, residual separation research center, better industrial design, and a temporary landfill to back up this 10-step program. Okay, now, next. I think the first five steps are pretty familiar to most people. Let's look at them again. The first five steps, source separation, you put your stuff out in the curb, or take it to a, a drop-off center, door-to-door -door collection, composting, more important than recycling, I'll explain why later, reuse repair and a, a community center. And if you don't have a reuse and repair center, in the Port Hope that that will be one of the things that you could start with. 
because it makes many jobs, good jobs, it will make money, it won't cost money, eventually it will make money for you. And it will be a place where people can get together and celebrate this community. Next. So, the first question is, how much diversion can we get with those five steps around the world? What are we seeing? Next. San Francisco, population 850,000. 50% uh, was waste was diverted by 2000. Next, 63% by 2004, 70% by 2008, 72% uh, of 2009, 75% diverted by 2010, 78% by 2011, and then last year they reached 80% waste. <laughs> Their goal is to next is to reach uh, zero waste or 100% diversion by 20, 2020. Next, just yeah, there we go. Zero waste by 2020, or very close. We can't get to zero waste. It's impossible to actually get there, but you can get darn close if you aim for it. Next, Italy. Over 200 communities are achieving over 70% diversion in Italy. Go on, uh, and some very quickly. Example. Next. Novara, it's a city near Turin, 100,000 people. They got to 70% diversion in just 18 months. Next. Salerno, which is near Naples, uh, went from 18% to 72% in one year. Next. In Belgium, 6 million people have achieved a 75% diversion rate. Next. Uh, today I'm going to focus on the residuals, steps 6 to 10, because I feel that some of you may not know, be too familiar with those. Maybe the early ones, but the latter ones, no. Next, how can we reduce and eventually eliminate the residuals without destructive methods? That's the goal, okay? Next, waste reduction incentives. Next, in Ireland, the government put a 15 cent tax on plastic shopping bags. In one year, they reduced the use of those bags by 92%. Next, in Italy, they have many supermarkets which allow you to refill your own bottles with shampoo, detergents, and so on. Next, uh, this store is one of my favorite places in Italy. It's Epicorta in Capanari near Lucca in Tuscany. Next, they have 60 taps for everything. Uh, shampoo, detergents, olive oil, milk, water, beer, um, honey. Uh, keep going. Next, and uh, here they're filling up detergents in your own bottles. Keep going. Um, olive oil, and oh, vino. This is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you get the box, you try this one, and there's a little line up there which tells you where it's produced. That's pretty good. And then you try this one. <laughs> No plastic. If you don't have your own shopping bag, you can buy one of jute or cotton. Next. Uh, here are the primary school uh, children, and in this school here, they've taken all plastics out. Plastic plates, knives, forks, spoons, cups, and replaced it with steel, stainless steel, china, and water. And that water is from the tap, not from bottles. Next. Uh, and the babies are getting involved too. Echo Bimbi. This is reusable diapers. Next. Economic incentives. This is the pay-as-you-throw system. The compostables, no surcharge. Recyclables, no surcharge. But the residuals, next. The more you make, the more you pay. Next. This system in Villafranca d'Asti allowed that community to go from 70% diversion to 85% diversion with that single step of the pay-as-you-throw system. And there are many ways of organizing that. Next. Spain, Ursabil in Basque country, went from 28% to 86% in seven months, using both the Italian method, the door-to-door -door collection, and um, the pay by bag system. Next. But now we, we've got to ask, what about the residuals? We've done everything we can. We've got the economic incentives, waste reduction initiatives. We've done all those good things, recycling, reuse. What are we going to do with the residuals now? And this is where, if the company was uh, honorable, they would say, we agree with all those things that you've talked about, Dr. Conant, we should do all those things first, but now, surely, you must agree to have a gasification plant. And I say, wait a moment, no. We can do something else. Step eight. Step eight, next. 
Step eight is the most important step to get close to zero waste. Next. Step eight makes the residual fraction very visible. And this is where you see the difference, right? With incineration or gasification, you make those residuals disappear into nanoparticles and ash. We don't see it. But from my point of view, we have to make the obscenities of the throwaway society very visible. We have to study our mistakes. We have to study bad industrial design of both packaging and products. So how do we do that? Next. We need to build in front of the landfill residual separation and zero waste research facilities. Next. Uh, residual is built at the entrance of the landfill. No material can enter the landfill without being separated and screened. Next. More material can be recycled. Um, a toxics can be removed and identified, and the dirty organic fraction can be biologically stabilized above ground before eventually you landfill it underground. And then finally, um, the non-recyclable materials have to be studied by our team. Now, next. This type of facility is currently running in Nova Scotia everything except the zero waste research facility. But we have those beginning elsewhere. So let's look at the Nova Scotia facility. You see, this is the landfill. This is the Otto, Otto Lake landfill outside Halifax. And there in front of it is the residual screening facility. So none of the waste trucks can dump straight into here. They've got to go into this facility. So let's have a close-up of that facility next. There's a close-up of the facility next. There I'm standing in front of the facility. Next, here's the residual fraction being dumped in usually black plastic bags. They're gonna be shoved onto a conveyor belt which takes them to a bag opener. Next, if you've never seen a bag opener, it looks like that. These are blades which don't cut everything but just you know break those bags open. Next, uh, then we have long conveyor belts with workers pulling up more recyclables and more toxics. Next. Here you see them on the, on the belt, they're well protected, they have helmets, they have uh, breathing apparatus, and they have gloves on separating these, uh, this residual fraction. Next. But they don't touch the dirty organic fraction, they don't touch the diapers or the kitty litter. That gets all the way to the end of the conveyor belt and is shredded and goes through a composting operation. Next. So here's the shredder. Now this is there. Now you cut things up, all the the, the pack, uh, plastic and paper and, and food scraps and so on are now shredded. Next, and this shredded, largely dirty organic material goes into these long concrete troughs. You, you probably can't see them, but they're they're rails on the top of those those troughs. Next. And this machine runs down those rails and turns the material, I think once a day. This aerates the material and facilitates composting and is gradually shifting the material from one end of the trough to the end. And that process is completed after 21 days. Next. Um, yes, and now it goes to the biological stabilization. Next. And you see it composting away in these troughs. As I say, 21 days of that. Next, and then it goes to the interim landfill, and, and that's behind the facility. Next, and this is what that landfill looks like. Now, there's something that you don't see there that you normally see at landfills. Do you know what it is? What? Birds, you've got it. No birds. Uh, they may have scared them away on the day that somebody took that photograph, but I had the same experience. No, no birds. So I think they've done a pretty good job of stabilizing that material. And I must say that this, this whole process was driven by citizens who refused to allow the landfill to be expanded, another landfill near Halifax, because it stank to high heaven. And the only way they would accept the landfill is if the organic material was separated and, and um, stabilized through a, this composting operation. This doesn't stink. Next. Next. So see, no, but the, there's a video I've shot of this in 2000, and you can see it on AmericanHealthStudies.org, our webpage, and several other videos, tapes. Now we need to add the Zero Waste Research Center. Next. So you would put inside this facility a Zero Waste Research Center to study this non-recyclable fraction. Next. 
And you, ideally, we should use the local universities, the local professors and students who are interested in sustainability, industrial design, advertising, all kinds of things uh, that they can philosophy, all kinds of things. But this is where they get their, literally get their hands dirty. This is their laboratory to study our lack of sustainability, to study our mistakes. Next. Now, the kind of things that we would go on is, first of all, you would, you would see mistakes. You would see in this facility things there that could have been reused, could have been recycled, could have been composted, if the citizens had put it in the right container. So you're going to get a message there, we've got to improve our education. Next. They could also recommend the best waste avoidance strategies from all over the world. So they'll be studying that for local businesses. Next. Develop local uses for some materials, like newspapers. Shredded newspapers can be used for cattle bedding, for insulation, and so on. Next, um, recommend better industrial designs to industry on packaging and products. That's the key focus. And lastly, um, next, uh, link with other aspects of sustainability. That's why we want the professors involved, to link with other aspects. Next, now, Nature makes no waste, you know that. And the reason it makes no waste is because she is superb at feedback mechanisms. Let me give you an example. If your body starts to produce um, a chemical or a substance, um, um, what we call a metabolite, that for some reason the body doesn't want to use at this point, usually what happens is that metabolite will switch off the enzyme that's producing it, the series of reactions, it, step, it shuts it down. That's what we call a feedback mechanism. You don't want it, shut it off. We have a waste problem because we've not used feedback mechanisms. We use landfills and incinerators and gasification units to deliberately avoid feedback mechanisms. Make it disappear, out of sight. Dump it in port hope. Next. If we don't like something, we simply bury it or burn it, thus avoiding a feedback mechanism. Next. Um, we need the Zero Waste Research Centre to monitor the local system and force the issue back to the front end of industrial design. Next. In other words, the Zero Waste Research Centre is where community responsibility meets industrial responsibility. And here's the phrase which I hope that you will remember. We in the community, once that we have, say, got 70 or 80 percent, we need to say to industry, if we can't reuse it, if we can't recycle it or compost it, industry shouldn't be making it. We need better... <laughs> Next. We need better industrial design for the 21st century. Hey, we're not going to get to sustainability with our hands in our pockets. We're going to have to sweat this one. This is the biggest challenge that we've had to generation after generation after generation since the Industrial Revolution. It's the biggest challenge after warfare, is to find a way to live sustainably on this planet. A lot of people talk about this, but we don't have a way of doing anything about it. And here we have it on our plates, uh, in our hands, every day, if we do the right things. Next. So, I want to introduce the fourth R. This is the, probably the quickest way you can explain to people what zero waste is. You are very familiar with the first, the three R's, right? Uh, the four R's. We have the first three. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Now, stop there. Now, notice something about that. That puts all the emphasis on community responsibility. Right? That says that we have to solve every problem regardless of what crap uh, industry decides to throw in our direction, like squeezable ketchup bottles. The, the, we have to deal with it. It's our responsibility. And I say, no, we need a fourth R, which is redesign. So that's industrial responsibility. We have our community responsibility, reduce, reuse, recycle, and we have industrial responsibility redesign. Next. So, here we go back to our linear society. We've got to consumption. We have to reduce, reuse, recycle and compost what we purchase every day. Next. And we need the residual separation and research facility to put the pressure back on the manufacturer. Next. To redesign.
That's, that's how we go from the linear society to the circular society with a feedback mechanism. Next. Uh, we must involve our most creative industrial designers, our professors and students in zero waste. Next. We need better industrial design. If I have more time, I go into that. Uh, has Claudia arrived? Well, that's wonderful. Now I can take three hours. No, I, no. no, I won't. I won't. I won't. If I had more time, I'd talk about. Well, I better. I better now talk about that. Okay. So, better industrial design is part of industrial responsibility. Industrial responsibility in the 21st century means we must start designing products for sustainability. None of this built-in obsolescence. Build things to last, that's number one. Number two, we need clean production. We have to stop using toxic things like lead and mercury and cadmium and arsenic and the halogens in our products. That's the challenge. So we, we've got a role for chemists to, to do, thank God, because I'm a chemistry professor. Um, and lastly, we need extended producer responsibility for both products and packaging. Let me start with a wonderful example of extended producer responsibility by a company in Ontario. Probably the best example of internalized packaging there is in the world today, in Ontario. It is in fact the beer store. Now the beer store have, for over 60 years has been using reusable glass bottles for beer. They are, their recovery rate for those bottles is 98%. Each bottle goes around 18 times, and it's saving the company a lot of money. It's cheaper. And there are 2,000 jobs involved, and there is no community in Ontario has the problem of dealing with beer bottles. It's all been done by the beer industry itself. And that's been going on for 60 years. Uh, saving money, creating jobs, this is an example of zero waste. For those who say it's impossible, it's happening. It's been happening all those years. Now, an example of, of zero waste with a company that makes products is the Xerox company. The Xerox company in Europe is recovering copy machines, old copy machines, from 21 different countries. The same trucks which take new machines in one direction bring old machines in the opposite direction. They take them to huge warehouses in Venray, Netherlands, and Dondork in Ireland, and these machines are stripped down. Um, they either use the whole machine if, it, if it's been in a showroom, they can clean it up, or they can use a machine if they can replace a few key parts, or they can strip down a machine for <coughs> usable parts, or they strip down the machine for uh, recycled materials. An uh, incredibly efficient operation. They are recovering, or they were when I visited in 2002, I think, what, they were recovering 95% of all the materials in those machines. But the really important news, and this is coming back from any company that establishes a zero waste strategy, is that saving them, that operation, that complex operation, is saving them $76 million a year. And that message is unbeatable. If they were doing it just for environmental reasons, we wouldn't have a chance in hell but because they're saving money with this approach, putting economics and the environment on the same side, we have a real good chance. Uh, next. And then, of course, this is backed up with an interim landfill for biologically stabilized dirty organic fraction. Next, and we've seen pictures of that already. Next, next. Um, these small backup landfills with residual separation to remove the toxics and stabilize the organics provide a more flexible and economically attractive intermediary role than incineration. Because don't forget, incineration gives us 25% of this stuff as toxic ash that nobody wants. So this is a better backup to everything that everybody else agrees with, recycling, reuse, and so on. Next. So the summary of the 10 steps to zero waste again, you saw it at the beginning, let's look at it again. Now what I like about this, is it begins with everyone. It begins with these ten things separate. If you, if you mix everything together, you get waste. But the moment you start separating, you're recovering resources. So it's 
starts with everybody here, everybody here. But by the time we get down to here and here, we are tapping in to the brightest minds in our society, the best designers in industry. We need to uh, uh, recruit and the best professors and students that we can come up with. Between these, these two, uh, we, it, it's very, very important. You know the first person to talk about zero waste, at least in Italy, was Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci in his writing says there's no such thing as waste. Uh, okay, the next one. So there we are. We start with everybody. We end with the brightest minds in our society. Next. So I reckon it's been demonstrated now from small communities of a few hundred to big, big cities of nearly a million that we can get 70 to 80 percent diversion. But the last 20 or 30 percent has to happen with these last two, two steps. Uh, with industrial responsibility. Next, uh, which we can, we have to get the rest, the 20 to 30 percent with industrial responsibility. Next. And this plan is better for the economy. Next. It's more jobs. Next. It's better for our health. Less toxics. It's better for our universities. More meaning, more relevance, more connections. Uh, it's better for our planet. It's more sustainable. And here's the big one. Hold on the thing here. It's better for our children. Now, can you imagine what it must be like for a 12, 13, 14 year old kid today to hear about what we're doing to the planet? He or she is hearing about global warming, ozone damage, loss of species, loss of rainforests, masses of amount of plastic in the, thrown into the oceans, the toxics that we're all now, all our babies are born with. This is depressing. This is depressing for them. It must be. I mean, basically, we're telling our own children there's no future. There's no future. Now, no one said to me when I was 12, 13, or 14 that there was no future. So I think the, the most important thing, as far as our children is concerned, this plan next gives us more hope it gives us hope it gives us an agenda it starts with simple steps you always have to start with simple steps and yes it will get complicated towards the end and yes there will be problems but don't forget any way we go from this point with waste we're going to have problems you're going to have problems if you build landfills you're going to have problems if you build incinerators and you're going to have problems with an the zero waste approach. I'm not going to minimize that. But what I can assure you is that these problems are worth tackling because they take us in the right direction. The problems of landfilling and incineration take us in the wrong direction. Even when we've solved them, we've ended up in the wrong direction. But with this agenda, we are moving in the right direction. And that's a good feeling. It's a good feeling to be moving in the right direction. Next. Now I've written a book about this in Italian. It's called Zero Waste, A Revolution in Progress. Next. That was published in March of last year. Next. An American version is that will be published in the fall of 2013. The title for the American version is going to be, and it's expanded and, and over this, is Zero Waste, Untrashing the Planet, one community at a time. Next. And here are the three authors. There's myself, you probably recognize me. And there's Patricia Lasciotto, who's led the zero waste movement in Italy. And I must tell you, that was an exciting moment for me. I spoke in 240 different cities in Italy in, in 58 visits there. Someone's got to do it. You know, drink all that vino rosso. Anyway. Um, and I get invited to communities to help them fight incinerators, like here. But Patricia, her community, which is Trapani, near, near Palermo in, in Sicily, they weren't fighting an incinerator. And it turned out that they were interested to hear about zero waste because they wanted their community to move in a sustainable direction. And so you've got 
this negative, or if you like, saying no to incineration is morphing in Italy to a yes to zero waste. It is the, right now, it's the best country in the world as far as movement on the zero waste is concerned. Now, what I'm getting round to is last week, the son of Ercolini, who is a primary school teacher, you saw his primary school students, last week he won the Goldwyn Prize for Europe for 2013 because of his work with the zero waste movement and nobody deserved it better than him. He's a primary school teacher in the, during the day and he's spending every afternoon and evening organizing the whole of Italy. He's an amazing person. Next, final thoughts. Effecting change. Effecting change is like driving a nail through a piece of wood. Next. The experts can sharpen the nail. Like me. Yeah, tonight I hope I've sharpened a few nails. I've given you a few arguments, a few scientific arguments, a few common sense arguments, and so on. But I can't. The expert can next next the expert can't push that nail through the piece of wood. You need the hammer of public opinion to drive that nail home. So my job is to give you the ammunition, your job is to use it. You can, with this kind of attendance tonight, you can stop this, you will stop this. I've never seen uh, a turnout this large which has not been in the city. this for 28 years. Uh, the three final messages. Number one, to citizens, don't let the experts take your common sense away. They love to stand on this platform and say, you're just being emotional. If you knew as much as our experts, our engineers, you would realize that we were brilliant and you're stupid. Uh, and, your, and your response, your reaction to this is just an emotional one. It's a selfish one. It's a selfish one that you just don't want this polluting thing in your backyard. Um, uh, it's, you know, just tell those experts, you live in Canada and it's a democracy. And you may want to make a lot of money out of this project, but there's a lot of people earning livelihoods with other businesses in this area. And if you're wanting to build, make this money out of this incinerator, it's going to threaten their livelihoods, their businesses, their farms, their property values, that's unacceptable in a democracy. And, yeah. and the most important thing I want to get across to you, this is the best time to beat this project, when it's still in the democratic process. Beware of decision makers who say to you, don't worry about the environmental stuff, that will be taken care of by the Ontario Ministry of the Environment or this agency itself. First of all, if you think those agencies are really looking after you, watch out. Um, you're going to learn that this is the hard way. But the important thing is when, the, when that decision maker says that, they are changing this. They're moving the decision from the democratic process to the bureaucratic process. And I can assure you, having spent or wasted 28 years of my life going through environmental impact statements, risk, human risk assessments, and so on, you can work your tail off going through those things. And you can come back with really good arguments, but you'll still get screwed. <laughs> Don't forget, they will have the money to outspend you every step of that way. They will have the money to hire these big engineering firms to produce a lot of gobbledygook. This is about this thick that no one reads, but the bottom line is it's perfectly safe for man, woman, child and insects. That's what it will say at the bottom. It is paid for. It's bought and paid for. Those consultants know exactly what they have to produce to earn the money and keep earning the money. And that's not based on some flippant analysis. That's based upon 28 years of doing this. So please, if you want to save your money, you want to save your money, if you want to save your energy, 
beat it now. Make sure that your councillors, make sure that the mayor knows that you do not want this incinerator. We fought the incinerator proposal in our county, St. Lawrence County, for five and a half years. And I remember there was this big, big public meeting with the council. And coming to the microphone was a professor of philosophy. I thought, wow, Baylor Johnson, Baylor, what are you going to say? You know, I was just looking forward to this because he was well respected in the university, well respected in town. And he got to the microphone and he said, when are you going to realize that we just don't want it? We don't want it. We don't want it. We don't want it. That's all he said. But it was a thrilling speech. Um, next, um, to politicians, put your faith back in people. You know? We, way is to go with the engineers, to go with these big machines, to go with high paid consultants. No, as far as waste is concerned, we are the key players here, the human <laughs> beings. And you've got to trust us. You've got to trust us that we're going to do certain things because we care about our kids. We care about our grandkids. We care about our community. We care about our planet. And yes, we will make a few little sacrifices, change habits, to do all that if we get the good leadership from, from you and you resist the, 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 the lazy solutions like incineration. And next, to activists. There are a few of you out there, I'm sure. There were many more after this campaign. And I meet activists all the time. And sometimes they say to me, oh, I don't go out anymore. Don't go to the movies. Don't have sex with my husband. <laughs> it's ruining my life. And then they turn around to somebody and they say, will you help me? What? Become a wreck like you? No way. No way. You're not a good example if this makes you miserable. You are a good example if you obviously enjoy this battle, if you enjoy it. If you enjoy the challenge of moving the, the society in a sustainable direction, which I do, I genuinely enjoy this. I'm having fun. I love it. I love meeting people like you all over the world, 60 different countries. I love it. And I'll get people that, to help me with this. So you've got to have fun. And one way we have fun, albeit a little embarrassing sometimes, is we sing. Next. And you can all sing this song because you've heard it before. We don't want incineration. We don't want incineration. We don't want incineration. We Unless we wish the dangers we had there to separate And we must do it now We don't want incineration We don't want incineration We don't want incineration We know there's a better way In Italian! In Italian! Generatory, a un modo migliore. 